because of war, because of violence in our communities, because there is still so much unrest in Jerusalem, we light a candle of peace. Because hatred is still so strong, because so many swords have not yet been beaten into plowshares, we light a candle of peace. May the light from this candle overwhelm the world. May the light from this candle say to all that God's peace is coming on earth as it already is in heaven. Friends, be not afraid. God's peace is at hand. What hope we hold this starlit night A king is born in Bethlehem A journey long we seek the light That leads to the hallowed manger ground What fear we felt in the silent age Four hundred years can he be found Broken by a baby's cry, rejoice in the hallowed manger ground. Emmanuel, Emmanuel, God is. And welcome to the second Sunday of Advent. Last Sunday, we talked about the name of Jesus as Jesus is King. This week, we're going to talk about Jesus as Savior. So let's see if you can guess what I'm cutting out. Got it? It's a link to a chain. Watch this. Here we go. 
a great big long chain. Some of you may have made some of these for your Christmas tree. So you might say, well, wait a minute. I thought we're talking about Jesus as Savior. What does a chain have to do with anything? Well, this is what I thought of when I thought of being saved. Let's say you are tied up with a chain and you couldn't get away and you were stuck. And somebody came through and took a wire cutter and broke the chain in half and set you free. They would have saved you from being tied up. And that made me think about what Jesus does for us. Now, most of us are not sitting around in chains tied up somewhere. But sometimes and throughout your life, you'll have things that feel like you are chained down. You might feel like beating yourself up, like you're not worthy and not good and not feeling good about yourself. And you're chained down in kind of self-defeat. And then you turn to Jesus and Jesus lifts you up over the, out of that. Maybe not immediately but over time. Uh, let's say that you had a bad friendship, a friendship that just wasn't good for your soul. And you had to break away and break that chain. Kind of the same idea. You break away and Jesus helps us move through those experiences. He saves us from those experiences. By knowing God, by knowing Jesus, by knowing we've always got somebody walking beside us, our chains are broken. And Jesus is our Savior. Let's remember that. Jesus is King. Jesus is our Savior. Have a good week, everybody. Bye. Good morning. My name is Patty Osbold, and I'll be reading from the Gospel of Luke 1, 39 to 46. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. God's word for God's people. Thank you to Patty for being our liturgist this morning. And also just a brief thanks to Patty for her ministry of helping us to fold these beautiful peace cranes uh, and to hang them and organize them into a mobile here in the sanctuary. They are here to stand in opposition to the senseless and needless acts of mass killing, gun violence in our country. Each red crane representing one such act and there are more than 100 such cranes hanging in this mobile. Would you please pray with me? Lord, Advent is a time of expectation. And the expectations that we all bring to the season partly include a longing for peace and a wish that it would become real. And so as we open up your word, we hear the story of Mary. Speak to us through this experience as we listen. Amen. Well, the date has been set. I'm traveling to Seattle. And as part of my listening to what God would say to me during this season of expectation, this season called Advent, is that I need to be more of a peacemaker, which includes learning how to practice nonviolence. And so the date has been set for me to travel over to Seattle and to convert this cold metallic weapon into a garden tool. Swords into plowshares, spears into pruning hooks, and in this case, a shotgun into a gardening tool. 
Advent for Mary as we look at Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 55, began with listening. And last Sunday, as we gathered here listening to Luke, we heard about the Annunciation. And the Annunciation is part of a three-part movement. The Annunciation, the Visitation, and the Magnificat. The Annunciation is perhaps akin to Mary listening to the God of peace working within her. The Visitation is where Mary then rushes off to Elizabeth, who's also pregnant at this particular time with, with John the Baptist. And then finally, after the Visitation, the Magnificat, where Mary just marvels at what God is doing in her life. And she sings those beautiful words, which we will consider next Sunday. But last Sunday, we began with contemplation, with listening. And it is perhaps listening a little more clearly and more intentionally to God's Spirit that has led me to make a decision to travel to Seattle with my shotgun and turn, it, turn that shotgun into a gardening tool. But I would venture to say with John Deere as I read his work that Mary was a contemp contemplative. She was a mystic. She was always listening for God and what God was calling her to do in her life. It's quite clear in Luke chapter 1 that the angel Gabriel appears to Jesus and <clears throat> says to her, Greetings, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. And Mary was greatly troubled, Scripture shares with us, and she pondered what the angel had said to her in her, said to her in her own heart. Have you ever sensed God speaking to you, perhaps calling you, beckoning you to do something that you really don't want to do, which is countercultural? Uh, people would not be uh, appreciative of you doing perhaps what you're sensing God, God calling you to do. And so she pondered what greeting this was from God. I love that word pondered because it reminds me of centering prayer or contemplative prayer. And the definition that I shared with you last Sunday of centering prayer, uh, consenting to the presence and action of the God of peace within. It begins with consent. And so as we listen with God, we know there is a God, that God wants to live in relationship with us, and God wants us to live God's ways. And so we approach God always with this notion of consent that God is God and we are humans loved by God, but God wants us to conform more and more into his will, living our lives into his will and in his ways. And so as we listen, we approach God with this, the notion of consenting. What do we consent to? We consent to the presence of God. God is within us. God is all around us. And as we consent, we are consenting not only to that presence, but also to the action of God working within us, trying to change us from the inside out. And I love John Deere's reference always to God, not just as God, but always to the God of peace. And so consenting to the presence and action of the God of peace within, God calling us always into a deeper relationship with God, which will, which will, relate to, which will result in a greater commitment, not only to peace, but also to the nonviolence that is associated with the ways of Jesus and the way of the God of peace. And so we begin there with listening. And my listening during this season of Advent has led me to take action, consenting to the presence and action of the God of peace within. My listening has led me to take action in terms of turning my shotgun into a gardening tool. How is God? First of all, how perhaps are you listening intentionally to the God of peace during the season of expectation? We know that the vision associated with the birth of Jesus is that Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, is going to change everything. And so much a part of that vision of the kingdom of God is that swords will be turned into plowshares, spears into pruning shook pruning hooks. And so there's this wonderful vision that peace will come with the reign of the Prince of Peace. 
And so we pro approach God with this wonderful sense of expectation. Mary ponders, contemplatively listens, consents not only to God's presence, but also to the work within her that is causing her to give birth to something new, the Prince of Peace. And what does she say at the end of that first part, that first movement of Luke? Let it be to me as you say. And she releases herself into the hands of the loving, grace-filled God of peace. But then what does she do? And this is our subject for this particular message. She goes to visit Elizabeth. She knows that consenting to the ways of God is not necessarily the popular thing to do. And so she seeks out community. She goes to Elizabeth, her cousin, who's already pregnant, pregnant for six months with John. And we know also that John is going to be a prophet in the wilderness, committed to nonviolence, calling people to repent. And Jesus later on walks into John's presence and John acknowledges this is the one, the Prince of Peace. But before that even happens, Mary, having received the news that she's going to give birth to the Prince of Peace, goes off to, 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 to visit Elizabeth, who the angel also told her is pregnant, and who is going to be a part of this new thing that John and Jesus are going to be inaugurating within history. And as Mary enters into Elizabeth's presence, the little baby within her leaps for joy. And so Mary spends a period of time with her cousin Elizabeth, united with the joy of two women who have released themselves into the purposes of God. A beautiful, beautiful story. And so not only is it important for us to hear that Mary says, let it be to me as you say, but we cannot walk the walk of God, God's calling alone. We need community. We need other like-minded people who are committed to the ways of Christ, which includes being committed to the God of peace and Jesus who shows us the nonviolent way of the cross. And so as you try to follow Jesus and in, in your life, community of like-minded people committed to walking the walk of love and nonviolence in the world is so important for you and for me and for all people who would follow the ways of Christ. But secondly, not only uh, is commun uh, community important, we notice in, in this particular visitation portion um, of, of Luke chapter 1 how important it is also to know who we are. Mary, or rather Elizabeth, says to Mary, But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And other texts translate that, translations tra translate that text as, Who am I? Who am I that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And I think the important thing for us to notice is that our identity, as we take the bold step to follow Jesus as he follows his father, the God of love, and begins the nonviolent practice of loving enemies, of going to the cross, dying for all people, including his enemies. The important thing is that we don't get our identity from the world and its ways and its biases. Rather, our identity is found in the fact that we are children of God and we find our purpose not in doing the ways of the world, but in doing God's will as we listen contemplatively to what that calling might be for you and for me. How is God during the season of expectation? How is God during the season of Advent where we light lights? This Sunday, we, we lit the candle of peace so appropriately. How is God calling you to be a part of God's kingdom? Thy kingdom, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It begins with listening, but then moves to action. 
And next Sunday, we'll learn about the third movement, which is, which is the prophetic part of Mary's Magnificat, the vision and the implications of that vision for the world. I travel to Seattle and I can't wait. It's not so much that a gun will be melted down and forged into something creative and life-giving, but the act, I hope, will solidify something that God will, raw, will, will, will do within me. God will disarm my heart, and in disarming my heart, disarm my life as well. And perhaps God will then better be able to use me as an instrument of his peace. Amen. Hello, Covenant. Welcome to Stewardship Season. I'm Chuck Anderson. And I'm Linda Anderson. Um, as luck and technology would have it, we're actually filming this stewardship message at a time uh, that is before our recording of that Zoom coffee break that sort of revealed what the use was for that alphabet card that came in your stewardship packet. Looked a little bit like that. So we're just going to assume it was an absolute fantastic success and there were many, many participants. Like, remember that time that we had to sit there and wait for Joel because he couldn't find his letter? Yes. <laughs> it, was actually, it was actually under his dog, Chauncey. Should have given it to Sarah. He wouldn't have lost it. No kidding. Or that time that Don, he was guessing that word, um, and he said suave, and it was actually serve. Yeah. Yeah, well, we like to think we're suave, don't we? Absolutely. Yeah. Anyway, we thought that was kind of a fun, creative way of showing covenants gifts that we possess. And uh, we wanted to take a moment to be celebrate and be proud of these traits. And um, to us, they're really good examples of how we bring Christ's love to the world around us. So it went something like this. As folks revealed the letters that they received, they tried to guess Covenant's key traits. We start off with this. And then we started to build the letters. People held up the letters that they received in the mail and then we started to build the words. Can you guess the first set? How about this next set of letters? Are there any words that come to mind? Okay, here's the next set of letters. Okay, and then finally, we got some winners. And we feel these truly are traits for us as a community of faith. In the stewardship mailing that you hopefully received, we summarize three key areas that we're continuing to do during this challenging time. First is serving. Our missions ministry team has gotten creative and you've been generous, donating every week so they can deliver essential items to groups like New Hope, Shalom Ministries, Family Promise, and many more. In addition, this year we will have given $16,000 to various missions. That's remarkable, Covenant. And second, delivering. Covenant has been focused on finding ways to deliver some sense of normalcy by creating worship videos and coordinating a couple of creative parking lot services. And third, connecting. We've been writing notes and making calls to each other and gathering in small groups using Zoom. Overall, we're finding new ways to be the church. So you might be wondering how uh, the closing of our building has affected our finances this year. Well, the answer might be a little surprising. So overall, even though our building has been shuttered, uh, our, our expenses have only decreased by about 5% or so. And we've lost a little bit of income because we're no longer able to rent out our space to small outside groups. Also, we've committed to paying our staff their salaries while they work remotely. And our mortgage, our insurance, apportionments to the conference, all those remain the same. So overall, our expenses haven't decreased substantially. As for income, well, you should be pretty proud of yourself. 
because we haven't really experienced yet a drop in income um, due to your faithful giving. And for that, we celebrate. Let's talk a little bit about how our church council, along with your feedback, has framed our vision for 2021. First, we have to look at some budget considerations, such as new pastor moving expenses, a decrease in facility rental income. We will need to replace the office computers soon. A new and improved website. It'll be a huge improvement for Covenant's online visibility. And since we'll be at this for a little while, we'll need to invest in the technology to provide better online worship experiences. That's reality. Here is our vision if our collective giving allows. We would like to consider an additional staff person, either full or half time to assist with online communications, social media for better outreach, and to manage some of the technology that will keep Covenant online and do better connecting with all of you. In addition, our multi-year goal has been to increase our mission giving to 10% of budgeted income. We were able to increase that percentage a little in 2020, and we'd like to increase giving a little more to get closer to our goal. It's a priority to support our various missions that desperately need us right now. So we encourage you at this time of stewardship discernment to prayerfully consider how you might support Covenant and maybe even expand the ways that we connect with your financial gifts. It's as simple as this. The more we give, the more lives we touch. And you would have received your estimate of giving card in the stewardship mailing this last week. And we highly encourage you to try to um, turn that back into the mail by around December 20th. All of that helps our, our covenant leadership team plan and budget for what's uh, going to be an exciting new year for us. Together, we'll figure out how to be the church of the future. Thank you. A big thanks to Chuck and to Linda for their shepherding of Covenant through the stewardship campaign for many years now. They always do such a creative job um, and we thank them for their time and their commitment, but we also thank you in your response. Thank you to, so, to all of you um, who really uh, have uh, given so generously to the ministries of Covenant United Methodist Church. We haven't even dipped hardly um, even through this pandemic. Thank you for funding the ministries of this church. Let us turn to God in prayer, and as we do so, I invite you just to experience the ambience of this, your sanctuary. The two candles are lit on the Advent wreath. The candles on the altar also shine, just simply as a reminder that God's light does shine in the midst of the darkness, and in your darkness as well. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for loving us. And thank you for the promise that your kingdom not only is coming, but is present already. All we need to do is decide to embrace it and to live in it and to grow it. And so, Lord, we invite your spirit during the season of Advent so to light the hearts of, our, of, of, of this congregation, that truly your kingdom might visibly be seen in the love and grace of the people that encounter our witness. Thank you for each person who's a part of this congregation. We pray especially for those of our number who are ill. Be with them, lay your healing hand upon them, restoring them to health and to wholeness. But above all, Lord, we ask that you will be very real in your presence with them. For those who are experiencing bereavement through the loss of loved ones, be with them. May you be their strength and their comfort. We pray for the continued ministries of this church. Lord, guide us into the future. We thank you for the leadership of our bishop, 
who responsibly, though we pray from a church that is empty, we pray together, united by the Spirit, with hearts that are full. Full because we know that you love us, and we know that you shine ahead of us the paths that lead to life. We pray for the world. We pray for our nation divided. Lord, regardless of who we are, where we are throughout the world, we ask that you might, you might unite all of us as human beings, as children of God, into lives that live for the common purpose. Hear our prayer, for we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. This does bring us to the end of our worship service. And just briefly an announcement, I hope you enjoyed those of you who were able to attend the Christmas lighting last Sunday, the first Sunday of Advent. We had a wonderful time, even neighbors dropped by unexpectedly. Uh, those of you who weren't able to do it, I hope just the glimpse that you gained from Brian's creative song this morning, Emmanuel, uh, shared the joy um, and the sense of promise as the lights were lit um, <clears throat> with you and with your family. Know also that we are planning to make the Christmas Eve, Eve service as creative as, as is possible, given that we won't be worshiping in person. Um, and stay tuned for what we might be doing. It might involve you coming to get a few things from the church in preparation for your own celebration of the Christmas Eve uh, service. And so now, once again, <clears throat> I remind you that we are not just dismissed. We are not just free to go. Rather, we are sent in Christ's name as ones who are called, ones who follow the Prince of Peace to live, love, serve, laugh in all that we do. Go in peace. Amen.